So you could buy yourself a jet lev. These are kind of interesting things. Um, we'll use these to make the point. You've already seen the guy taking off, it looks like from a house up in the front ranges above Colorado, the egg-shaped house with the uh, jet pack on, uh, using, I presume, combusted uh, combustion products uh, as a jet coming out of those things. We've used in the past um, a little uh, clip of someone using, uh, it was in kind of Bastille Day celebrations in France. It was a guy wearing almost little, something the size of an American football or a rugby ball on each hand uh, and using those to, to lift themselves above and to ostensibly uh, also in the UK for kind of mountain rescue things. You could zoom up a mountain much faster than, uh, than uh, walking, maybe staying five feet above the ground and just whoosh, migrate up to the top. Sorry, I'm, I'm just going to keep on playing this because it's the one interesting one that I have. Uh, and then there's this. That, uh, those, those also would use combustion products forced out. You burn something, it expands. The expansion creates a, a jet, just like a jet uh, engine on an airplane. And it's that uh, cha chemical change that gives you momentum of the stream of fluid coming out. And when that stream of fluid hits the ground, it provides the reaction for you to be uh, levitated. So here's um, a, a play on that. It's called a jet lev. I don't know how much they cost, 15 grand or something. I guess it's the evolution of the jet ski for those who want everything and want to play around in the water. Uh, you can see that it has two jets on it. It has a, an umbilical yellow uh, cord, tube, that attaches to a, uh, a little barge or a, a pod that's behind it. Uh, you can vary the uh, probably the rate of flow that comes from that umbilical. The umbilical must have a pump in it and a compressor that compresses the fluid, sends it to behind the neck of the person flying it, and then splits it on either side so that it comes out and is um, balanced. Obviously, if it was uh, just a single line coming out down your spine, maybe you'd have a hard time balancing. And certainly you might have a hard time directing one uh, direction of the other to be able to move in a direction that you want to, to travel in. So, so that's the, the jet lift. So if we get to it today, we'll talk about Bernoulli. Um, we'll use Bernoulli to try and uh, solve that problem. And I suppose the, pro the problem might be you'd like to know how to size the pump. So what power pump do you need to, to be able to, to do that, to lift a a person off the ground, 100 kilograms, I guess, plus the, the kit isn't weightless. Certainly the tube will have a, a weight. Certainly the rig on your backpack will have a weight. And actually the jet of water coming down isn't weightless either. So perhaps we, we have to think about that. But the one question you might ask is what the power is. And the fundamental part of knowing what the power is, is knowing what velocity you want it to squirt out of the nozzle. And so I suppose we could think about this uh, as kind of um, an inverse San Francisco international problem where you have a static jet uh, um, and I guess a static uh, truck it moves across it but parallel perpendicular to the jet and then the truck being moved over and so this is uh, well it's the same kind of idea right there's a jet that's coming out it's striking something and instead of moving that thing it's striking and pushing it into San Francisco Bay, it's actually elevating the thing that it's coming from. So I guess the corollary of that for the, uh, the jet would be the truck staying still, acting as a reaction barrier for the, uh, the air from the jet, and taking the brakes off the jet and letting it roll forward. It probably doesn't need the truck behind it to do that, just because of the reaction with the air. But probably you've all seen in airports uh, these blast fences that they have close to some terminals, which will be kind of a louvered screen where the, the jet goes in front of it and turns its engines on. It deflects the, uh, the air upwards and kind of out of harm. So that's one. So what else do we have on here? Oh, it's still running. So, so that we'll try and do an example with that today out of the mundane. I guess when it's open, I can't see the things on the top just to move it from one to the other. 
Uh, of course, this is a bit of art. It's not so obscene. This little boy peeing in Belgium. And uh, okay. shrouded there, but you can see the tinkling coming down. Same kind of idea. We'll talk about free jets today, uh, how they fall. And of course, um, you can imagine, oh, I guess it does. Oh, I didn't want to do that. It's already gone. Um, jet lev. And I guess the other one, we probably won't get to this today, but if you look in the last video, so the videos for this class, the most recent ones are 2016, uh, for whatever reason, but the reason for that is because um, last two years we've been doing, this has been our test week, uh, and I switched around this year because I wanted to be able to record new videos, is kind of my motivation, so that they'll be 2022 instead of 2016. And this is uh, the Flying Scotsman, I guess it's called. So someone trying to get a land speed record for cycling. I guess, can I see here? Oh, I guess I, I was going to say this is his head. Of course, that's not. This is his butt. This is head down here. Uh, it's aerodynamic so that uh, there's not much drag. And this is a 60 mile an hour, 60 kilometer an hour. Uh, no, 60 mile an hour uh, run. So that's probably 90 kilometers an hour. So I, I noticed the, the Vuelta, the Tour de France is finished this summer. The Vuelta just got done, road races. They go 60 kilometers an hour. Uh, wouldn't be a, an unusual speed on a, a slight downhill. They get up to 90 kilometers an hour on a real downhill. But this is doing 90 kilometers an hour probably on a, on a flat. And so we could also calculate how much power the cyclist is. Uh, if we throw the calculation together at the end, I think it comes out as 15 kilonewtons. It's a bit high. I think a cyclist is something like, sorry, 15 kilowatts. The actuality of a cyclist is something between 400 and 1,000 watts, kilowatt. And so that's because we choose a bad number for our aerodynamic uh, behavior. Uh, but otherwise, that's another thing that we can look today. Uh, so that's it. So I'm going to get rolling with that. Hopefully, everyone's well. Um, I you received two emails this uh, weekend. One, of course, was the mundane deliverables for week five. Um, and the other one you should have got on s midnight on Saturday if you're up to receive it, or seen it on Sunday if you looked at your email. It's about the test. Uh, I don't know that I need to go through that. I think it's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, for the first one, I'll log on on Zoom at uh, 7.45, the test will open at 7.55, extra five minutes you get. It'll close at 8.31, exactly, nominally 8.30. I typically say five minutes to go, it's 8.30 in two minutes, start wrapping up. You have to submit your answers. If you don't submit your answers on Canvas at 8.31, it'll just take what you have. So that's the fail safe. Um, I think in future meetings, instead of me being on Zoom, I'll be on Canvas chat to ask for questions, ask questions of all, and I reply to all if I don't want to answer it or if I think it's inappropriate to answer. What is the answer to number one? No. Um, I will say so, but certainly you can ask any questions you want. Um, do the practice test. I guess I could ask you, who hasn't done the practice test? Fantastic. Oh, come on. Who hasn't done the practice test? Should do it, just to get yourself keyed in. Of course, it's no different. There are numerical answers that you put in. The right answers are plus or minus 10%. So to answer someone's question last time, should we use 10 meters per second squared or 9.81? Almost certainly 9.81. 10 uh, percent either side seems a lot, and I think it gives you the benefit of the doubt, but uh, you can eat that up quite quickly. Uh, my aim is to not be an ass and uh, ask uh, questions, eight questions that all rely on the answer to the first one being correct. So typically, I know in the first question you've already seen what they are. I mean, you can probably surmise that the first question is either a submarine or a balloon. Um, there's a, there'll be a multiple choice answer at question number three because that answer is used in the next three questions. And so the multiple choice uh, answer is to kind of reset your mind that you should be able to get that answer, hopefully. It's not supposed to provide you with angst if you're not getting it exactly, but it's to provide you with uh, the step to do the, the next ones. So the, the goal is for them to be independent of each other. So 
you know, one error early on uh, doesn't carry through. Uh, there is no credit for working, um, just for the nature of these. We used to have uh, three, one, two hour exams on Wednesday evenings, uh, eight o'clock till 10 o'clock with people allowed to stay till midnight where extra credit was given for working. You can look at the tests before 2000 and you'll see that they're longer and more involved. Um, and so the concession is for these, you can't have both, right? You can't have the easier, more straightforward, being led through the, the questions, calculate this, calculate this, calculate this, uh, but with extra working. So that's, that's kind of the deal. Um, and that's about it. Uh, so yeah. I hate to cloud everyone's day with this. So, so a week to, to day we'll gather. At this time you'll already be rolling in it. So rolling on with it. And so that's about it. Like, did, anything else that I should say? That's about all. So all the information I think is in that email. I think, as I say, on Wednesday, and it is Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, so don't send me an email at the end of our second midterm saying, well, how do I, how do I get my exams dropped? I, I came to one of the, the tests on the first week, and I came to one of the tests on the second week. That actually happened, and so don't think that. And um, other than that, any questions? So I hate to cloud our morning with that. So back to fluid mechanics. All right. So um, week one, introduction to fluids, viscosity, uh, unit weights, etc. Week two, fluid pressure at point. Uh, rate of change of pressure with depth is equal to unit weight, gamma. Week three, integrating that, fluid pressures on structures uh, to be able to look at Location, magnitudes of resultants, locations of resultants, and mechanisms by which things can fail, open gates and otherwise. Week four and five are really uh, Bernoulli's equation. And so last week, as you know, we talked about uh, Bernoulli's equation. Well, 4-1 was accelerating fluids, but 4-2 uh, and 4-3 were Bernoulli's equation. And so the contents of that, if I turn my tablet on, uh, were to look at the form of Bernoulli's equation. Okay, so it did connect. I'm going to use my favorite color. And we know that it comes in two forms, two flavors. One is unintegrated, which is equal to, uh, actually, no, this is, this, this, these aren't two forms. These are the same equation. There's another f form that becomes integrated, unintegrated, which is equal to, <laughs> Okay, my machine has turned itself off for some reason. Uh, equal to a constant, so we can write it at two individual points. Uh, we did it for our airfoil, my teardrop airfoil, to be able to define the behaviors of streamlines as it goes past. We define the behavior in terms of normal to streamlines and along streamlines to be able to write behavior at multiple points. Uh, by convention, we had written it as upstream and downstream in all the examples we did. I'm writing a bit smaller than I want. That's true if each of these terms on the right are zero. Uh, sorry, that's, we don't care actually but if it's upstream or downstream unless these terms are non-zero. So these terms are non-zero only if, for instance, the viscosity is not equal to zero. So we said Bernoulli has four requirements. Irritational flow, no um, eddies, uh, incompressible, but we still use it for air and we have used it for air. Um, isothermal was one of them. I, I think there was a more simple one was one of them. But one of the, the chief ones was that inviscid. Inviscid means that the viscosity for Bernoulli has to be equal to zero, in which case these two terms, which we haven't talked about yet, are equal to zero. So these are losses due to flow in pipes. They're frictional losses due to viscosity. And so far, we'll ignore them, including this week. But the whole essence of when we talk about pipe flow 
to be able to size pumps are losses within pipes, uh, which are significant. And we need to account for those uh, if we're able to size pumps in the right way. So we'll continue today doing upstream and downstream. There's no doubt in my mind that 90% of the times that you use Bernoulli, it will be in this form along a streamline as opposed to across one. And I guess uh, we did some examples, I think, right? The last time we talked about the whole idea of being able to flow across a streamline and look at behavior. Uh, this would be our lower streamline, so this would be our hump. Uh, we talked about doing uh, behavior as we go across here. I guess this is what we called N. This is what we call Z. Hopefully this is big enough that you can see what's going on. Uh, and we talked about the magnitudes of those uh, pressure distributions. Right? We use this. And so just to repeat the result that we got, if this was 0.1 and this was 0.2, this, the result we got was equal to P2 is equal to P1 plus gamma H. plus, minus, what was it, rho v squared over r times h. And so um, we noted that as you go over here, at this point here, this gradient is exactly equal to uh, this term without this term here, because uh, if we drew the radii, for this, right? the radius of curvature for a streamline that goes through here is r equals infinity. The radius for this one is r not equal to infinity. And the radius for this one would also be in the opposite direction. And so if we drew, I'll, I'll, I'll draw it outside here. So if we drew this distribution of pressure versus depth, so this would be minus z, right? Because this is z. We'd find out three conditions. This is point A. This uh, is point B. And this is point C. And it's all because of this plus minus. If this term is an infinite R, then it drops out. And this is just the, the swimming pool pressure. And if it's going over a hump, then it'd be, we'd be lifted out of our seats as we go out over the, the hump in the road. The pressure difference would be this. This is no longer infinity, so it's finite. This is a finite velocity. It would actually be the same velocity as this velocity here. These would all be the same velocities. Uh, but just because of the sign of this changes, the sign changes because of the direction of the inward normal in this particular case. Remember, we wrote an inward normal which was n, the inward normal goes in this direction and this direction. So in this case, it's in the same direction as z. In, in this case, it's the same direction as z. In this case, it's opposite z. So it changes the sign of that. So there was, a, I think there was a, one of these questions last year. So that means there probably wouldn't be unlikely to be one this year. It's not till your next test. So that's kind of the recap of what we've done. So 90% of the time that we would use Bernoulli's uh, for along a streamline. So the things that we can use it for, which we'll do today, are these two things. Not sure why we've gone uh, strange here. All right, so we're doing three, two things. <laughs> Doesn't want to be right away. 
We'll do free jets, which comes directly out of Bernoulli, and we'll talk about continuity. And so the basic idea has been that uh, we have six terms. If we want to write this equation to solve it, we need to know what five of the terms are, and we can solve for the remaining one. We talked about pitot tubes uh, and uh, the ill-fated Air France flight. Um, and one question came up of how this works. And so the idea is um, that we would write the equations for Bernoulli at two points. We'd write it here, and we'd write it at this point here. And the easiest way to, to write this uh, would be, um, I guess I would write it, I'd write it between these two points. So between P1 over gamma plus Z1 plus V2 squared, sorry, V1 squared over 2G is equal to, it can be P2 divided by unit weight plus Z2 plus V2 squared over 2G. And we have to figure out what we know about this. Points 2 and points 1 are essentially at the same elevation. So let's get rid of that term between them. So these both zip out. Point 1 uh, is a proxy for a point 1 that perhaps is out of here. And at point 1 out here, the velocity is going at velocity v. So this is not equal to 0. So this is what we might know or what we might want to know or what we have. P1 would be equal to the pressure that we'd measure at this, which would be atmospheric pressure. And I guess if we're working in atmospheric pressure, this would be 0. And this is a stagnation point. So V2, by definition, is equal to 0. And P2 would not be equal to 0. And so we'd have P2 over unit weight is equal to our only remaining term, which is V1 squared over 2G. Multiply both sides by unit weight. And you have from this rho g v2 squared is equal to 2g, which is up to rho v2 squared over 2, is equal to the pressure. So the bottom line is, if you measure the pressure at point 2, which is what this pressure inside the cockpit is reaching, then relative to atmospheric pressure, which we take as gauge pressure as 0, Hence this. If you could do the same calculation in absolute pressures, you just end up with a, a P P1 uh, a P2 minus P1. That's all. Uh, but otherwise, which would be exactly the same pressure differential, and you can use it to calculate velocity. And so, I mentioned before that this was the fate of uh, whatever flight it was, Air France. Flight 447, leave, leaving Rio for Paris, uh, disappears off radar, went through a big uh, thunderstorm. Uh, the pitot tube at the cold temperatures, minus 60 centigrade at 30,000 feet typically, froze, covered. You block the tube, can't measure the pressure anymore. And it was a, an a, it's an Airbus A330, which is the surrogate of a, a 777. I'll get to you. <laughs> and it, uh, as a result of that fly-by-wire, went up and down uh, and ultimately crashed into the Atlantic. Yeah. What about HP when you were uh, writing the equation? What was the what, sir? What, what happened to HP? Uh, I didn't see it when you were What is HP? I don't remember using HP. My, oh, perhaps the pencil's too. Where, oh, this is what I want. HP, where's HP? Yeah, on the, on the left side of the newest stuff, you, at least you'd written it on the first slide. Oh, yeah. So we're assuming still for today, all this week, that this is the case. Okay. If this is the case, these, these ones you mean? Oh, 
this is also equal to zero. That's pump head. Sorry, I didn't what, notice what the that pump head. Okay. So it's the head that you'd have to apply in a pump to be able to make it to pump. In our case, we're not supplying any energy to the system, and so pump head is still zero. Yeah, thank you. I, I didn't even notice that was there. Good question. And so this exists, even on something as sophisticated as a, a 777 or an Airbus 330 or the, you know, the carbon fiber 787. They all have a manual way of being able to evaluate uh, velocity, uh, and now it's heated. Heated so it can't freeze and therefore give a, a wrong signal. You can imagine that having different shapes to this orifice might give you different pressures. And so it's dead flat because you want to be able to get the exact amount. You don't want it to do this because we've just kind of said that if it goes over the hump, then the pressure that it measures at this point isn't necessarily the same as the far field pressure because of the geometry. And so you don't want to have a lip here with fluid piling up and going over the top because you kind of have a, a mini stagnation point here, which is the stagnation point is where the air comes here and it goes around here. And of course, it goes around this thing here and keeps on going. So if you ever fly out of State College, as you climb up onto the plane, you'll always see it right behind the uh, pilot's cabin, one of these things. Don't care about this. Don't care much about this. You could also, I guess, imagine a directional pitot tube. So if this was uh, in plan view of the pitot tube and you had three different ports with measurements of pressures at the ends of those three ports, uh, the air would have to come down here, and it would have to go around here. And you can imagine that the pressure in 1 and 2 might be different. Sorry, 1 and 3 might be different from 2 if you're flying in a straight line in the direction of 3. These would probably be symmetric pressures. If you deviated from that so that the main flow was coming in this direction, then 3 would be different from 2, and 2 would be different from 1, etc. And so you could use it to gauge the direction of the airflow. Don't know if those are ever used. I certainly have never seen one of those on, uh, on an airplane. So that's the first thing, pitot tubes and why they're important. Uh, we have two other things to talk about. Free jets, we said, but let's talk about continuity. We made the point before that in solving Bernoulli's equation, we could solve, we have six terms, and if we know don't know one of them, in this case, I guess, velocity 2 squared, we didn't know, we could solve for it. We can also solve the system if we have only four terms and solve for two behaviors. And the way we do that is by invoking what we call continuity. And that just means that the volume of flow that flows down between two stream lines so a streamline is this, and a streamline is this. And between those streamlines is a stream tube, which would be this thing here. And so if we had, for instance, how do I write it down at the bottom? Yeah, I do. So if you had a cross-sectional area, which was 1, we have an average streamline velocity going across that, which is v1. And we have an area, a2, and a streamline velocity, v2, which is each of these. Then clearly, the rate of flow in area 1 times v1 is meters squared, meters per second. So this is meters cubed second. This is a, a volume flow rate. So typically in this class, we'll call this Q. And here we have A2, V2 equals Q2. And quite simply, these two have to equal each other. Otherwise, we'd be accumulating fluid in this volume. If you have a, a roadway, you have more cars coming into the intersection than leaving it, you accumulate cars. Fluid is no different from that is that if we want this to be steady state, I guess the, the fourth requirement for Bernoulli was steady state. Steady state means the same amount comes in as leaves, and the picture as a result of the streamlines don't change with time from now to 100 seconds to 100 days. 
And so we can use that to constrain it. And so we use that. Typically, this will be the case that we can use a1 v1 equals a2 v2 as an extra constraint. And if that's the case, since often one of the things we want to calculate are the velocities, if we can link the velocities together, which we're doing here, then that allows us to solve an equation where we have nominally four things that we know and two things we don't know. For instance, if we didn't know each of these velocities, we could solve for them. And a more correct way to write this would be multiplying it both sides by the density of the fluid. So if we multiply it by the density of the fluid, then this would be volumetric flow rate, Q, meters cubed per second, times density, which is equal to meters cubed a second, times kilograms per meters cubed, kilograms a second. So often we think of stream flow in terms of cubic meters a second, but in some cases it's convenient for us to work in terms of mass. The only correct way is to do it in conservation of mass, not volume. So in petroleum engineering, environmental systems engineering, where you write equations for underground flow of fluids, you'll always write continuity, conservation of mass, in terms of mass. Continuity is just another word for conservation of mass. Volume in equals volume out, or I guess it is really mass in equals mass out, simply. So I don't know we'll use that today, but that's one of our watchwords. Standard result. Uh, so, okay. So we said free jets and conservation of mass, continuity. So we've done the second. Let's uh, skip back to talking about free jets. Free jets is a bit like the jet lev, except now uh, it's only moving under its own weight. It's not being pumped. So in other words, this tank is not closed at the top and with a, uh, a pressure gauge on it. It's not that. Um, it's just with a free surface in it. And so it exists like, I don't know, certainly now, when I grew up as a kid, we had a cistern in the roof. Water was pumped into that as a storage thing, and then the pressure of that was what fed the house. Usually now, certainly in State College, the, the mains are pressurized, but you do see, I guess, uh, water towers, which is the same idea. A water tower would have a, a free surface in it. The difference with a free jet is that the, the spigot at the bottom isn't going down a pipe and into a mains and into a house. It's just open. And so we might want to ask what the velocity is that comes out of the bottom of this if we open up the spigot. And we can do that quite straightforwardly just by writing Bernoulli's equation between two places and solving for the unknown. So that's what you have here. I usually write it in terms of divided through by unit weight, but this is just the other form. What do we know for this particular uh, case? So point one, a large tank. Large tank is Bernoulli code for zero velocity. If the tank is large, then any volume of fluid that comes from here doesn't deplete the elevation of this tank, right? And depleting the elevation of the tank means that it's moving down at some velocity V1. So V1 for a large tank is equal to zero. So this is code. Remember that code. So this is zero. Unit weight of fluid and Z. We have to choose a datum somewhere. If we choose it at point uh, one, point two rather, then by definition, this term is zero. The pressure point one, well, it's open, atmospheric. If we use gauge pressure, then atmos equals zero. And the unit weight is just equal to the height. The height of this is equal to h. OK, so these are all defined. We know all of these, if we know h. P2, it comes out of here. It's the orifice. We know that immediately after it comes out, by definition, right here, the pressure acting horizontally has to be atmospheric. And that atmospheric pressure equals zero. Pressures act in all directions at the same magnitude. So this has to be zero or atmospheric. 
Am I writing too small, by the way? I, I guess it's good to keep both things on at this stage. And so the only thing that we want to be able to solve for is this. And so if we arrange it for velocity, I won't go through derivation, but you can do that. You only end up with two terms, and it looks like this. You end up with this pressure head here, and you end up with this velocity term here. If you equate those, then you end up with velocity, 2, being equal to 2gh. H is just the elevation of z above the datum. And you solve it. And that's true for a free jet. Pretty straightforward, standard result. Um, interesting enough, and we'll solve it, was that if you could imagine this with a jet that came out, oops, not very good drawing, Imagine you had a jet that came out of the bottom that did this. So that you had a velocity coming out which is equal to this. Interestingly enough, and kind of maybe puzzlingly, this would be the same as V2. I'm lasting too long. This would be Bernoulli. This would, you could write Bernoulli at this point here. This is a streamlined velocity in the direction of flow. And so V2 that we've calculated here is a streamlined velocity. And so if we had a bend in here, as far as Bernoulli knows, if this was open and it was coming out of this point here, turning the corner and coming out here, this would also be velocity 2. And this would be squirting out at exactly the same velocity as this magnitude here. So it doesn't matter about the direction. It's important to remember that it's always the streamlined velocity that you're talking about. And just as in the case for the um, looking at the pressures normal to a streamline, the velocity normal to this streamline is what? It has to be zero, right? If you're driving down the road, the velocity normal to your direction of travel is zero by definition. And so that's true. The other thing I guess you could also do is that this, as this stream comes out, you could write Bernoulli further downstream, in which case the height h would be equal to this value plus this value. So it'd be, how well can I draw squiggly brackets? So this would be h plus h which would be the height driving it. And you could go through derivation, but you could just substitute this h here as being equal to h plus h. And I think that's what this derivation is here. And not surprisingly, you get this. <coughs> so you can play around with this. I won't do it here. But you can show that this equation for the velocity is exactly the same as if you stood here and you dropped this out of the bottom of the tank. A bit misleading for me to say that now because it already has some velocity as it's coming out of the tank, right? This velocity is presumed to be non-zero. It has a finite head, gravity's finite, so it's larger than zero. This, if this was at the opening two, this would be not moving, it's zero velocity. But if I dropped it, then it'd be accelerating due to gravity. So if uh, I wanted to calculate the velocity below, in this particular example, actually, the velocity would be equal to, if I place this head as equal to zero, so in other words, I'm starting here at zero velocity, because I've assumed that this, zero, this h is zero, then the velocity of this at point 0.5 after dropping it at point 0.2 would actually be v5 equals... 2g uppercase h. And uppercase h is just the distance between the nozzle where it started at velocity 0 and the point at which it hits the, the table. Okay? And so that kind of should reinforce in your idea again Bernoulli equation, f equals ma, when you've solved in statics or dynamics 
the motion of bodies, this is no different. In this case, I guess uh, you'd be using your expression to say that the velocity is equal to v0 plus at, right? That would be the equation for this. Velocity zero, acceleration due to gravity. This is uh, gravitational acceleration, g. And you could calculate what the velocity would be by knowing g and how long it took to get to 0.5. That's exactly what we're doing in that, that expression. It's just written in a different form. Uh, and I'll leave it there. Okay. So free jets are important. And it's important to realize that this is also a free jet. We won't do it today, but I think we'll do it tomorrow. The streamlined velocity comes out to be the same as this vertical velocity. But of course, it won't go across here for infinite. It'll be the same as uh, shooting a rifle. A bullet drops as it goes. Throwing a football doesn't carry on forever uh, if you throw it horizontally. And so acting on this also is gravity. And so it'll keep on going at the same velocity forever. Always this velocity, v2, which is equal to, what was it, 2gh square root. It will always go at this velocity, v2. Nothing will stop it. Newton's third law, is it? Everything will go at the same speed unless it has a reaction applied against it. So it'll keep on going at this, but it'll also go down at this acceleration here. And so the trajectory it takes will be a parabola. And we'll calculate that next time to be able to do. It's one of the recurring questions you see on, on assignments and tests, etc. We've assumed that the velocity is constant right across it. We'll find out that if the fluid has viscosity, then the velocity at these boundaries are zero. It's kind of like when we looked at our viscosity equations. We always took the viscosity at the plate as equal to the velocity of the plate. We've kind of ignored that because we've assumed that velocity, viscosity is equal to zero, and therefore we don't need to worry about this particularly. But that's not always the case. And I guess you could imagine that if the jet is, is pushing horizontally, the pressure head at the top is bigger than the pressure head at the bottom, and therefore the velocity profile shouldn't be equal over it. But we ignore that. It's too, we have enough problems to, to worry about small changes like that. So we could finish there, or we could do something else. And so my plan was to do the jet left. I guess this has come back. If you came in not so early, let's play this again for everybody. The jet lev, I think it's 15 grand. I don't quite remember. Perhaps it's 20 grand, 30 grand. A play toy, if you want one. If you've, if, if you've already got a jet ski and you want something else to, to wow your friends with, you can get this. The yellow umbilical uh, is attached to a pump, which is HP, is providing the motive pressure into this, which we won't deal with yet. And it's squirting water at some velocity. You can control the velocity that comes out of the nozzles. You control the attitude of the nozzles. Uh, to be able to alter your direction. Um, and yeah, kind of cool. We'll show some later on in the class, which show you people doing these off Catalina Island in California, and not just being on the surface, but directing themselves underwater. So they dive under the water and come up like, uh, like dolphins, which is kind of interesting as well. But uh, how can we use uh, Bernoulli as, as our understanding to be representing that? So I'm going to go back to a a spare open page, and I'm going to start from this. So I'm going to do my, my drawing bit now. So here's the, the deal. So what am I going to do? I'm going to draw our jet lev. Oh, I didn't want to draw that, but it's... You'll recognize what this is. Uh -huh. And I'll do one. Yeah. So uh, one, two, three, and four. And you could think of these as our terms in Bernoulli, which you have up here. What order are they in? Pressure, velocity, elevation. 
So you can think of these as pressure head, um, elevation head, and velocity head. And we could look at what each of these are. Um, so in here, this is inside the machine. So if we look at uh, point numbers one, two, three, and four. Pressure, I don't know what pressure is. We'd have to define that. Elevation would be h, I suppose. Velocity, well, I don't really know what that is right now either. That might be something we'd like to, to find, I suppose, you could imagine. Point two. Point two is much easier. Atmospheric. So this is zero if it's atmospheric, acting all directions. Elevation, essentially equal to h. Tilde is my uh, shorthand for almost. And v squared, I guess we'd still want to know what that is. That's, that would be the one we would find. Three, um, well, the pressure also would be atmospheric still. It's just before it strikes the ground. The elevation would be about zero. And the velocity would be, I guess we'd want to find it. Or, right. And four is the more interesting one. The pressure, we don't know. The elevation, we do know. And the velocity, we would take as zero. Stagnation, right? It's going at some high velocity here, but zero pressure. It changes all that velocity into pressure, and the velocity is zero. Exchange of momentum on that surface. So what we could do is we could take a much simpler system and contract it down. Because we also have kind of a water column, which has a weight to it right here as well. And I don't want to deal with that. And so I'm going to deal with this uh, here as point number two, and this as point number four. So if that's the case, uh, then what we can do, uh, why don't I go back to black, we can write uh, P2 over gamma plus uh, Z2 plus v2 squared over 2g is equal to p4 over gamma plus z2. Be on your toes. Make sure you correct me when I invariably do something wrong. And we can take the values that we have from this. This is going to be uh, 0. This is going to be 0. This is going to be, well, we're compressing this down. So now I've made it conveniently short so that z2 equals z4. If that's the case, then these aren't 0, but they certainly cancel out. V2, we don't uh, know. And P4, we don't know either. So what do we need to know? Well, what we do need to know is that we have, well, I'll draw it, draw it here, is that we have a weight acting downwards and a mass of someone 100 kilograms. I used to be 100 kilograms. My COVID weight is less. <laughs> and so weight is about uh, 1,000. Hopefully that's the correction, right? Newtons. And so what we can do is we can write this expression just in terms of those terms. We can write it as V2 squared over 2G is equal to P4 over gamma. We can write the fact that acting upwards is P4 
and it acts on an area which we're going to call A. And so this is a pressure here. And we know from this that pressure equals, sorry, force equals pressure times area, which equals the weight of the person. This is a force, this is the pressure, this is pressure four, so we can do that. So what we could do is we could write, multiply, I keep on turning this on, because of, we could multiply both sides by A. Uh, and we could multiply both sides by unit weight. And so we have, well, I won't switch it around, we have, I'm going to write this out as rho g. Rho g area v2 squared over 2g is equal to this expression. This and this cancelled. This term here is just uppercase p, which is also equal to w. So we have something we can solve. And so me rewriting this, I'd get rid of the g's. We're on the same planet. Um, and it would be that velocity 2 squared is equal to the weight, which we know, uh, times 2 divided by density of the fluid multiplied by A. Is that right? Oh, fantastic. So what are those? So this is 2 times the weight of our person, which is 10 to the 3 newtons. This is the density of the fluid, 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And the area, well, I took it as 4 inches by 4 inches. It's about right. The jet looks like it's about this size. So 4 inches conveniently is 10 centimeters. 10 centimeters is conveniently a tenth of a meter. So this is uh, 10 to the minus 2 meters squared. So this is 4 inches by 4 inches, roughly. And my math is never super good, but see if I can actually manage this. Well, what is it? Do the units work out? Um, they do because of Newtons. Um, v squared is equal to 2 over 10 to the 3. We've got 10 to 3 on the bottom. I like my line straight. <coughs> 10 to the minus 2 equals 2 times... 10 to the 2, and this is going to be, it's in, uh, you can do it, the calculation, but it's meters squared per second to the 4, because newtons are the force required to give, so yeah, just to write that out, we'll come up to the witching hour, 1 newton is the force required to give a mass of 1 kilogram, an acceleration of 1 meter per second squared. So you can convert these newtons on the top to cancel out with kilograms. And this ends up being, uh, so V2. So this is 2 times 10 to the 2, which is about 1.4, which is square root 2, times 10 to the 1. Which is about uh, 28 miles an hour. And so that's the velocity. We need to, to size a pump to be able to do that. So the other thing we can look at also is to look at um, the system which has a velocity coming out of the bottom, which is equal to V2. And we know that this is holding a force which is equal to W. And so we know that the power is equal to work over time, 
which is equal to the force times displacement over time, which is equal to force times velocity. Right? Displacement per time, this is displacing per one meter per second, this is the velocity. And so the power is given by, in this particular case, I'll call it P, just not to confuse it with W, is going to be W multiplied by velocity, which is equal to 10 to the 3 newtons times 14 meters a second, which is 14 kilonewtons. Fourteen kilowatts. Don't know if it's right or wrong. I know that a cyclist uses about a thousand a kilowatt. So we talked about the Flying Scotsman. Uh, a, a hard cycling cyclist expends something like between four hundred watts and a kilowatt. And so this is a, a small engine, a very small engine on a car, and it's certainly pretty, perfectly reasonable what we do. So so far we've used Bernoulli. We've only used it with uh, six terms where we know five of them, and we solve for the remaining one. I guess next time perhaps we'll uh, branch out to use continuity and try and do it for the case where we have to constrain two unknowns out of the six and therefore solve for the magnitude. Perfect. Right on time. Great. Kind of fun. And it actually worked out. <laughs>